folks say that business and pleasure don't mix. But in Miami, that's not necessarily so. part of the image and Malcolm X was uh, a fiery man a feared man by many uh, the, the power structure had successfully created uh, the image of the American Negro as someone with no confidence no militancy and uh, they had done this by giving him images of heroes that weren't truly militant or confident Several decisions were handed down in Tampa that shocked many of us, tore a lot of us apart inside, and made us extremely emotional. I Somehow, in this town, black people must be able to deal with this in an orderly fashion. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't believe justice was done, but I feel like in the end it will be done. And Miami just erupted. It started before sundown at the Metro Justice Building with a peaceful rally involving both blacks and whites. But as C.T. Taylor tells us in this Live Eye report, it quickly turned to violence. Well, the, the Jim Crow was so thoroughly embedded in our minds, our being every black person I knew, uh, that the signs weren't even necessary to know where you're supposed to be and where you're not supposed to be. And uh, as a boy growing up, I had no reason to think that that would ever change. Uh, the civil rights movement, of course, I was a young man when that happened, but as a kid seeing that, that was just the way the world was. White and black, you sit here, they sit there, and it was never questioned. It was so endemic and so common that when they took the signs down, I still saw them, still felt. As a matter of fact, you could see the imprint from where they took the sign down at the front of the bus. Uh, so it took a while for that change to settle in for me. Even when it did happen, I, and I would intentionally sit in the front of the bus uh, because I knew that I could, and I felt uncomfortable doing it. I knew the law was on my side. I knew no one's going to bother me. But having come out of Jim Crow, even though I was determined to exert my right to sit wherever I wanted to on the bus, I still felt that some white person could accost me. Uh, the driver could still ask me to move in the back. So I never felt secure, even after the, the signs were removed. Yes. Well, keep in mind, my father was a fruit picker. He was at the very bottom of the socioeconomic scale. We were migrant workers for a while. So when Roosevelt came into, into office and these CCC camps were set up, Civilian Conservation Corps, and they had people all over the country putting in roads and bridges and parks and all of that. Roosevelt did that with the New Deal. And those jobs applied to blacks as well as whites. Although the black jobs were segregated, if you went, the CCC camps were still segregated. But my dad and other black men in Deland got to do work that they never would have gotten to do uh, had it not been for Roosevelt coming in with these CCC camps. So for him, it, it, it was, a godsend. He could, he could, you know, he could now uh, 
uh, go to these camps. I think my dad went to two or three different places in Florida and participated in putting up uh, uh, um, camps for soldiers and putting in uh, military facilities. He loved that. That was a step up for him and his own sense of self. Um, I, I think my dad misunderstood Roosevelt to some degree. Maybe most blacks at the time misunderstood the president. Uh, Roosevelt was not a liberal. Uh, Eleanor was a liberal. His wife was a liberal with Mary McLeod Bethune pushing Eleanor because of their close relationship. That is what moved the president to some of the things that he did to, uh, to improve relations, uh, to improve situations for blacks. But the, the, the New Deal, the CCC camps and other things uplifted everybody. The whole country got a lift from that. And my father appreciated that. And yeah, I, I, uh, even when his mother died, he didn't cry. At least I didn't see him cry. He may, may have, but he was visibly, upset when Roosevelt died. I really cannot drink Publix orange juice today. <laughs> I can't. I, I was, my dad would bring home sacks full of tree ripened navel oranges, all, all kinds of oranges and grapefruit, tangerines. So we never had stale uh, citrus. We had the freshest uh, citrus off the trees. Um, and it was just glorious. It was also a source of, of nutrition for us mm -hmm. because we had as much of that as we, as we wished. But yeah, my dad would come in at night from work with a big orange sack and just open it up and his food would just spill out on the floor and, and it, was, it was wonderful. Um, actually, when we were migrant workers going up to New York to pick potatoes and apples and beans and tomatoes, uh, in large measure, that's how we ate. We ate what we picked. We ate what the farmers were growing. And I think that applied to most black people wherever they were in the South. You got to eat what uh, you were allowed to grow on your own little piece of property, or you ate what you worked in. Uh, this is an aside, but I have photographs of black people picking watermelons in Florida. And you see these black folks and little children sitting around during their break time with big slices of watermelon. And part of the stereotype about black folks and watermelon, which some of us find uncomfortable, having worked in agriculture, having worked as a migrant worker, watermelons provided sugar, instant nutrition to people who worked in that industry, as did other things that we speak in historically that black people worked in. So it was not uncommon that that would be one particular kind of substance that people would find very, very nourishing, water. You know. So of course, folks who worked in the hot sun all day had the opportunity to work in a field or a grove that provided peaches or apples or something like that to help your nutrition and provide water it was a very, very important thing. That was a long answer to a short question. We were living in a shotgun house in Deland. Um, we rented it uh, from a black man, actually. Uh, and we had um, a shared toilet. There was a, a man owned another house behind us. And this was very common. Uh, you had one bathroom between the two properties and the families shared the bathroom. That was very common in Overtown in Miami in those early years. You didn't have your own bathroom in your house. Uh, that was a common area in the back of these buildings that everybody who lived in, the, in that set of buildings used those bathrooms. Um, but yes, it was a shotgun house raised off the ground. Uh, the dog slept beneath the house. The chickens got out of the sun, laid eggs under the house. That was, uh, we, we played as kids. That was the only comfortable shady spot in, in, in the land in August. You got out of the sun, you go underneath the house and play doctor sometimes. Because you had shotgun houses in Virginia, in Tennessee, in North Carolina. They didn't e emerge simply through South Florida and the Bahamians and what have you. They were endemic to the South. Everywhere you went, you'd see shotgun houses. Uh, that does not detract from their African derivation. This type of, of dwelling, I think, derived from West Africa. But I think it was widespread across North America, uh, not just the Caribbean. We moved, we stayed in Overtown a short time, just a few months, and then moved to Oklahoma. Sure. Yes, I did. It, it still does. It was amazing, Sydney, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, we moved out of this shotgun house and what have you in Deland into this 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 three bedroom home. Um, they're all cooker cutter. They're, I think there were two or three different types. But they're all basically 
the same little houses. Um, and we were thrilled. The first time I got to, bathe, to get a bath in the bathtub was the first day we moved to Bunch Park. Uh, but to us, it was a palace. It was just, it was just marvelous. But of course, it was all black. We were near the end of the time when the federal government could build racially segregated housing. So Bunch Park was for black veterans. Um, and I was just up there a few weeks ago. Uh, a lot of people expanded their homes, much, much, made them much bigger. Some of them uh, added another story or two. But the interesting thing that I noticed about the community, and I, and I had not driven around there in a, in a long time, is the mango trees. Sydney, there were folks who planted mango trees when I was a kid, you know, just, a, just put a, a, a seed in the ground. There are now mango trees in Bunch Park that must be absolutely over, over shattering the houses and properties that they're on, um, which I think is a wonderful thing to see how so, so many of those trees were never cut back to just let go. It's almost like being in the Caribbean when you drive through Bunch Park because the tree, and there were no trees out there. When we moved out there, that was cow pasture. That was all Graham property. Cows have been uh, raising out there. And the government buys it and they put these homes in for blacks and people brought in the trees and the shrubbery and the lawn and all of that and changed the environment totally. We moved in June of 1951. The thing about me, you don't have to do a damn thing to them. Just leave them alone and they'll just keep producing mangoes until you get sick of mangoes. Uh, but I, I was so struck by how so many of those little houses have been now totally surrounded by beautiful trees that folks planted 50 years ago. You know, speaking of that, when, uh, living in the land, which is, you know, all of that is orange country, at least when I was a boy. And as soon as the, the spring came in, March, early April, the orange, the, the orange trees would bloom. They, they stopped blooming. And this aurora of orange blossoms would just permeate the, 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 the air. Any place you went for about three or four weeks, you could smell orange blossoms. Just a, a, a glorious memory of my childhood. That was and decent, man. Yeah. You're decent. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. You see, you weren't supposed to be good. You weren't supposed to be smart. Um, when I was in school, some to some degree, I think there's still something about that in our culture. Uh, but being a football player, even being a band member, was a higher status thing than being a good student. People figured, yeah, we're, we're nerds. My dad would not allow us to play football. So you niggas not going to get killed out there. He had five sons and none of us were allowed. And uh, that was his word. He, you know, he used the N word a lot. Uh, but yeah, being a good student cut both ways. The girls didn't want to date good students. They wanted to date football players. The school you're talking about is Northwestern. Okay. School. That's at 71st Street and about 12th Avenue. No, the school that I went to was Dorsey High School, named after D.A. Dorsey. Oh, it's no okay. Longer, it was a, it was, it's no longer high school now, but uh, Dorsey High School in the British City. From the Dorsey House? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, quite a distance. Let's see, the Dorsey House is like on Ninth Street, and this school was up on 50-something, so many blocks oh. away from the house. Let's see, Dorsey owned land all over the place. He owned land from Key West to Fort Pierce. Okay. Well, you know, as I said, that cut both ways. Uh, um, I had really uh, very nebulous plans for going to college. I thought that I would be lucky if I got to go to Florida A&M uh, or, or Bethune Cookman. I had no idea about Morehouse. I never heard of Morehouse College. Um, luckily, I just sort of picked it out of a list of colleges and ended up there. Well, you're a good student indeed. Well, uh, the first time I felt racially threatened was on my trip to Morehouse from Miami to go to college that, that fall. Uh, and I'll give you a short version of that story, but I was, uh, my parents put me on the back uh, seat of the bus, the Greyhound bus, uh, that uh, September uh, night and gave me lunch, uh, a bag, a brown bag for my lunch, and told me to stay on the back seat until that bus got to Atlanta. This was on a Sunday night. And um, I agreed to do that. When the bus gets out of Fort Lauderdale, I moved to the middle of the bus and that caused me some problems the next day because I was harassed by whites who insisted that I was in the wrong place. 
Unfortunately, a white Marine on the bus saved me in the sense of he intervened and people forgot about me. And uh, the driver put me off the bus and I had to, uh, outside of Waycross. So I had to wait until the next bus for Atlanta about three hours uh, because the driver said I was creating a disturbance by sitting where I was not supposed to sit. Um, and then um, Morehouse was just, I had no idea what to expect when I got there. The country boy, even though I was coming from Miami, I really was a country boy. You know, I was, this was, you know, and the first, one of the first things I see was sitting on the front uh, the steps of the dorm. And here comes two canary yellow uh, convertible Cadillacs, the Eldorado Cadillacs, driving onto the campus. And one was being driven by Aretha Franklin. And the other one was being driven by her, her, her brother, Cecil Franklin. They were bringing him to Morehouse from Detroit. And all of us guys who just got there, wide-eyed, look at these two beautiful, my God, who the hell is that? Cecil Franklin was arriving at Morehouse. You know, his daddy was C.L. Franklin. Have you heard of, heard of C.L. Franklin? His father was one of the biggest preachers in the country. C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's dad, had a radio program. And my mom and grandmother would listen to Reverend C.L. Franklin every Sunday night. So he was a rich man and could afford to send his son to Morehouse with a, his own Eldorado Cadillac. He had, his hair was processed, had a mohair suit on. Uh, and, we were, and then he, of course, took some of the guys over to Spelman across the street and his, and his Cadillac. Oh, we were, it was just, who is that guy? And of course, Aretha, Aretha was not known. She was still, she, she was not known. She was still singing in her daddy's church at that time. Anyway, the next day, uh, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College, a legend in his own right, called Cecil Franklin into his office and told him, send the Cadillac back to Detroit, cut that, pro cut that process off your hair, uh, off your head, and get a regular kind of clothes. Uh, the next weekend, Aretha comes back and they take that Cadillac away. That was my first week at Morehouse. Uh, she and her sister and Cecil went to the band room and sang that afternoon uh, for a long time, then she left. Um, that same week, that first week at, at Morehouse, the man who was the custodian in our dormitory belonged to the Black Muslim organization. He was a follower of Elijah Muhammad. So he came to us freshman, we had nothing to do. He said, you guys wanna go over to hear Malcolm X? He's a young minister just coming out of New York. Uh, he's a rising star, uh, come go hear him. So we took the bus over to the mosque and sure enough, uh, Malcolm took the stage. I'd never seen anything like that or heard anything like that. Full house, women on one side, men on the other side. They search you as you go into the mosque, you can search. And Malcolm takes the stage by himself and just lets go. He burned the flag, the American flag on stage. I'd never seen anybody do anything like that. And of course, he goes on and on about but it's basically black racism. He finally gets down to the point about uh, black men marrying white women. Um, just absolutely uh, and uh, trash that. And uh, the black of the bear, the sweet of the juice. And all the black women on their feet clapping. And then um, he said things that disturbed me. All white people are evil. They'll all kill you if given a chance. And I found that very disturbing. I never heard people talk. It was just purely black racism. Of course, as you know, he changed after he went to Mecca, but listening to him in 1957, Malcolm was very difficult to hear if you were trying to be a fair-minded person about race. Um, but Morehouse, Morehouse was wonderful for me. I was, in a sense, born there. Um, the first time someone called me Mr. Dunn was my first class that first morning in my math class at Morehouse. Mr. Dunn, talking to me, so they were talking about was my dad here, um, but we were we were we were we were given certain standards that Morehouse men were not supposed to disrespect, and one of those was with women. A Morehouse man never, never, never puts his hand on hands on a woman, except in extreme self defense. We were taught from the beginning: you respect women, you treat them politely, and then they showed us how to escort a woman into a movie theater, how to handle being, you know, doing it right and not just 
as we had maybe observed coming along. And uh, they also taught us, because I think they anticipated that some of us would rise to some stature in life, that you never abuse power just because you have it. Never use it just because you can do it. Uh, the best show of, 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 of being a powerful person is to not display it and not abuse it. And I, I took that lesson to heart. I was, I was going to become a, um, a nuclear physicist. That was not planned when I went to Morehouse. But then I had to take physics and that changed all of that. I became a psychology major um, and just hung around with some of the brightest guys you could imagine. Um, many of them now are very well positioned in life. Maynard uh, Jackson, after whom the Atlanta airport is named, was in our class. Julian Bond was a classmate of mine, went on to be the first black person to be elected to Congress since Reconstruction. Uh, so many others I can name uh, who went on to absolutely uh, wonderful careers. But Mike, when I got there, Mike, I was 17 when I got there. And the girls wouldn't have anything to do with me. I was just too little. I was too young. We, I went to the freshman. So I got up out of high school a year early. I never finished the 12th grade. So when I got to Morehouse and started trying to be a, a college student and trying to do what college students normally do, these little girls would have nothing to do with, they wanted sophomores at least, at least some, much less a 17 year old early admission student from, so it took a while. I was probably a junior before I felt that I was being given due respect at Spelman College. How to be a good person. And I think the third lesson for me was give back. You know, some give back to the community um, and give back to Morehouse College, of course, but give back to your community. Um, so we took that, I took that. Many of the people who went to college with me took that to heart in, 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 uh, over town and then expanded to some other communities. My daughter has now taken that over and has started her own community garden effort. So she's sort of continuing my legacy and roots of the city and planting and whatever. Yeah, my, I, I just, you know, I was teaching um, at, at, uh, at, at FIU and I had tons of students. And my sense was that since they were getting an education out of state university, they should give something back to the community. So I offered them a chance to do community service on the weekends and over town, clearing vacant lots and putting in gardens. Um, at first we just put in ornamental, ornamental plants and finally we started planting food. Uh, but it gave my students a chance to really go to overtime, which they never would have done. And mind you, 90% of my students were white or Hispanic. I had very, very few black students at that time. No, we didn't have very many black students at FIU. So I would, I would give, them, give them that opportunity to either go to overtown for four weekends or uh, write a term paper of a minimum of 30 pages. So in 15 years of doing that, I had three students choose to do the paper and they were all pregnant. So I got a lot of kids in overtime, clearing trash, clearing, you know, it was amazing. Uh, there'd be 30 or 40 white Hispanic kids in overtime on a Saturday and folks were just, who are, who are these whites? Have there just been the white folks in overtime since the Klan came through in 25? But I don't think my students forgot it because they never would have gone to overtime and later on to Liberty City. Uh, had it not been structured into their academic program. That's incredible. That's great. Yeah, I, I want to be an lots. I said, we cleaned a lot of vacant lots and put, up, put, in, put in a lot of gardens and just left them for people to come and take their vegetables when they weren't ready. My daughter, did. My daughter has done that through her own nonprofit called Health in the Hood. So she's doing what I did at a much larger scale. In the hood. All right, I'll look into that. That's great. The health in the hood. That's my baby. She looks like <laughs> you. You favor her, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great compliment to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All my daughters are beautiful. All my girls are beautiful. I have four beautiful daughters. That makes, me, that makes me very happy to hear. And I'm a girl's girl, so I'm sure I'd love to meet any of them, too. So. Roosevelt University in Chicago. I was on short duty 
I, I had joined the Navy and had a two year period of shore duty right outside of Chicago. So um, the Great Lakes Naval Station had a, a, a an on campus um, master's program for us and I got my master's through, through that program. Then I went back to sea uh, on another carrier and at that time I applied for graduate school at Florida at, U, at UF. Um, that is one of the uh, low points of my recollection of my history, frankly. Um, I had uh, decided to become a psychologist and I wanted to get my degree, my PhD from my own state university system, UF in particular. So I applied for admission uh, from sea. Uh, we, were, we were in the Mediterranean and um, a letter came back a few weeks later. I still have it. Dear Dr. Dunn, um, the University of Florida does not admit Negro students in its graduate programs. However, the state of Florida will pay your tuition at any university to which you are accepted that is outside of the state of Florida. I was in uniform protecting my, protecting my country on the other side of the world. And I get this letter from Florida saying, you're black, so you can't come here, but we'll pay for you to go someplace else. Now, you know why they offered to pay for me to go someplace else, Sydney? <clears throat> because of the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, equal, um, equal uh, as long as the facilities were equal, they could be segregated. That decision came down out of the Supreme Court in 1896 in the Plessy versus Ferguson case. So if the Southern state didn't have a PhD program at the black school, Florida a &M, they had to either make it available to a black student at, uh, at a state white school or pay for it to be gotten someplace else. And that's why that offer was made. And I turned it down and applied for admission to Tennessee, UT, and was admitted full scholarship, never paid a cent. So today, when UF and Tennessee play anything, I, I, I cheer for you for, for Tennessee. That was a star that will never heal for me. For my own state, this is in 66, 1966, to say you can't come here without your black. Uh, it was, and mind you, it was late in the civil rights era for this to be happening, 66. Another two or three years, that was no longer the case, but it was at that time. Tennessee was totally different. Um, they didn't have many black students. I was the only black student in psychology. Um, there, was, you know, there was a downside of being the only one, which you may already know. Uh, being the first or being the only one is really overrated. Mm -hmm. You end up being isolated. Uh, folks don't quite know how to relate to you. Uh, you're one of us, but you're not really one of us. And in social settings, they sort of go their own way. Uh, but I could not have been treated better than I was at the University of Tennessee. Um, you read about the part that when I got, I thought I was gonna go to Officer Candidate School and end up being sent to recruit school because I failed it. Let me take a moment and tell you that story, if you don't mind. Yeah. I finished Morehouse and I decided to become a Naval officer. My dad had been in the Navy. Of course, at that time, Black could only be cooks or stewards. Uh, my brother was in the Navy. He was, was not an officer, but my brother joined the Navy. So I wanted to become a Naval officer. So at the end of my Morehouse studies, at my bachelor's, um, I joined the Navy with the intent to apply for OCS, which required a college degree. And um, that September, I was sent uh, on a bus with other recruits from Miami to Jacksonville to be inducted into the Navy. Since I was the only one in the group, the only black and the only person with a college degree, they put me in charge of the group, the 12 white guys going to Jacksonville to be inducted at the big Naval induction center in Jacksonville. So we get to Jacksonville late that day, about four or five o'clock at the induction center. And the petty officer calls up the white guys that I brought in and gives them what they call it, what was called a chip, kind of a permission to slip to go across the street to be able to get uh, lodging at this hotel and food. The rules of that hotel still stands today. 
So the white guys all come up and they get their chips to go across to the Roosevelt Hotel. And then at, at the end, they call me up and they give me a chip. So you take this across the railroad track. There's a rooming house that takes care of our black recruits. You'll be staying there. So um, it was now five o'clock or so in the late in the day. So I took this chip, walked across the railroad track and it was a whorehouse. There's no other way to put it. It was a house of prostitution. Um, there were women with men all night in this place. I got no sleep. I got there in time for dinner. I'm sorry, I got there too late for dinner because it always served people, but there were flies on the food that was open in the kitchen and roaches, even in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So I didn't eat anything that, that evening. The next, and I didn't sleep very, very much that night because there were women, men coming all night. The bed had, chin, you know what chinches are? Bed bugs are? And the mattresses, you know, the bed had, had bed bugs. So I set up rather than getting in the bed that night. You could see them all. Next morning, I go down for breakfast and it's the same thing, a filthy kitchen. I couldn't eat anything in that kitchen. So I go back to the induction center to take my test to go to OCS, I was candidate school. And I failed miserably. And the, the petty officer who was sort of handling things called me up and he said, you're the one supposed to be going to OCS, right? I said, yes. He said, you failed the test. You're going to recruit camp like the rest of these dummies you brought in here. And they put me on an airplane and sent me to Great Lakes to recruit training. But before I left, I said, well, this, I didn't sleep last night. I haven't eaten in two days. This is not fair. Well, you can put that in writing if you want to. So I would like to. So I wrote a letter. This officer came over and took the letter. And then I went off to, to be a recruit and not an officer. And near the end of my recruit training, this limousine pulls up in front of the barracks with the admiral's flags on it. And this man comes in and asks, who is the recruit done? That's me. Uh, the captain wants to see you. The base commander wants to see you. I get in the car that he drives me to this officer's, this, this commander's office, and there's the letter that I had written in Jacksonville. He said, you complained about what happened in Jacksonville. The Navy is going to give you another chance to take the test for Officer Canada School tomorrow morning. So I went back to my barracks. I took the test the next morning and I passed. And they then sent me to Officer Canada School uh, within a few weeks of that. But if I hadn't complained, and you know what they told me, Sydney? They said, no one else complained. That's where Louis Armstrong stays there. When he comes to Jacksonville, that's where Donna Washington stays. They all stay there. No one complained about it before. Well, anyway, that's another one of those things I remember um, that was painful. I don't wow. know. I, it's, it's, it, it, was, it was a very painful experience to, to have to go through that. And so one of the reasons I, uh, you know, I, I love the Navy, but I found the Navy to be very difficult to, uh, for me. Um, at the time that I was a naval officer, 0.002% of the officers in the Navy who were line officers who were on, who were on ships were black. 0.002% were black. They had black physicians and attorneys and supply officers and what have you, but for black officers on ships, fighting ships, very, very, very few. The Navy resisted that to the very end. Um, only President Kennedy was able to move them towards doing something about it, which may be why. Um, they started admitting blacks around my time to, to, to go to OCS. Oh my gosh. That's exactly what they said. Exactly, it was good enough for Louis Armstrong, it should be good enough for you. Exactly what they told me. Why are you complaining? It's a nice house. You've been using it for years and years and years. Uh, but in, in the end, I was, you know, I, I got to be an officer, which was my, my goal. I, 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 maybe I should tell, since we're talking about the Navy, uh, I got out of the Navy because of my sense of being used as a black officer. Um, shortly before Ken, President Kennedy was killed, he came to our ship for a visit. I was on the bridge when the president came. So I got to see Kennedy. This was in June, he was killed in November. But leading up to that 
opportunity to be in the same space with President Kennedy was also a very harrowing and I thought racist experience for me. We would, uh, you got time for this? Maybe I'm telling you more than you want to know. Well, the, the president of uh, the United States spends one day with each of the branches of the military. The Air Force gets them a day, Army gets them a day, Navy, everybody gets the president for one day. And that, that, that year, Kennedy decided that his day would be spent and I was a bridge officer. I was on the bridge with this ship. That was my duty. Uh, and there were 1,300 officers on the ship, and I was the only black officer on that ship. When Kennedy was being inaugurated, he noticed when the midshipmen from Annapolis walked by, there were no black midshipmen, former naval officers. He commented on it. Why are there, there are no Negroes in the, in the, in the, among the midshipmen? And a man named George uh, Anderson was the chief of naval operations sitting behind the president and heard Kennedy say this. They knew that Kennedy was noticing that there was a shortage of black officers. Maybe he became sensitive to that. So now Kennedy's going to come to this ship. Oh, I could tell you how the preparations we did to get ready for the president. They got two carriers, maybe even three carriers together. I think there was a third one. All these ships in this big fleet to impress Kennedy. And we practiced, 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 practiced for the president's arrival. Jets flying over, submarines coming up, guns going off. And I was on the bridge. My duty was going to be on the bridge when Kennedy arrived and came to the bridge. And Kennedy was late. He was more than, more than an hour late. He was at, we were off the coast of San Diego on this carrier. So Kennedy was flying from San Diego out to where we were and was late. Kennedy was always late. So my watch was up. My four hours on the watch was up. The other three guys who were on the bridge with me, all, of course, were all white. Our watch was up. So these guys go to the captain, permission to leave the bridge, sir. The captain says, okay. And I go up, permission to leave the bridge, sir. And he said, no, Lieutenant, remain on the bridge. This never happens. When your watch is over, you leave. Unless you're at war, you fight, you leave. So all these white guys are looking at me. Why did they tell Dunn not to leave the bridge? They wanted me up there when Kennedy came up there. So he would see that I was a black officer on that ship. And sure enough, Kennedy lands. Um, I'm on the bridge looking down at him landing. Um, he was so, the president was so engrossed with one of the men who was tying the, the helicopter down, he totally missed the show. He missed the helicopter, the, the submarines, the jets fly over. Finally come to the bridge and I had never seen a more miserable looking person. He looked tired. His back was killing him. He had his personal doctor with him, this woman. Uh, with him, trying to help him. He was miserable. So they set Kennedy in the captain's chair and he sat and they would bring person after person, admiral after admiral, gentleman to meet Kennedy and he was just bored, bored. And for a few seconds, I was standing maybe five or six feet from him most of the time. For a few seconds, my eyes met his. The deepest, bluest eyes I've ever seen. Just for a few seconds. And I thought, that he and I were the only ones who didn't want to be on that bridge. By that time I felt used, embarrassed, I wanted to be out of there. And I think Kennedy as well uh, did not want to be in that place at that time. But after that happened to me, I decided to get out of the Navy. So I felt that I was being used uh, and, it, and it, it, it hurt my feelings. But you got to keep in mind, Sydney, I was a, a little boy crawling on the ground in, in New York, picking up potatoes with my family, trying to survive. And here I am at age 24, 25, uh, on the deck of, of a, one of the biggest naval ships that, that we had at the time, and doing my watch, having control of the ship. So from picking potatoes to being an officer on the deck of an aircraft carrier was a great, great leap. And it speaks to the greatness of our country. In spite of all the things that I'm complaining about, and others have more reasons to complain than I do. My life's trajectory has been upward. Um, rather than being stopped or rather than being pushed down. And um, that's not just because of my own interest in pushing forward my own agenda, my own life, but because the country changed enough to allow this to happen and to allow someone like me, even in the 1960s, to 
got a PhD degree and join a great university and teach for 35 years and end up as chairman, chairman of, this, of the department. You know, so I guess what I'm trying to say is black people have a lot of reasons to complain about America, mm -hmm. um, including myself. But in the end, I wouldn't live any place else on the planet. In the end, the country is moving. Well, let me, let me, we were moving in the right direction. I think I'm a little concerned with the last few years, but I think overall, the country is moving in terms of race relations and in terms of equality of opportunity, the country is moving in the right direction. I think we have a little slowdown right now because of the things that are happening politically, but this I see as a blip in the road. Our country is going to survive even a temporary um, slowdown in acquiring basic rights for black people. First, in my position is be careful about not sounding too smug about things. Because you know, I go to Overtown, I go to Liberty City, I see the suffering. You know, my work now is with uh, convicted murderers facing the death penalty. That's what I do these days, trying to save these people from being executed by the state of Florida. And I've seen where they come from. And I can compare my own life's trajectory with what my clients have had to go through. And I'm a blessed person. I'm a lucky, lucky person. You know, I, and that's because of my folks, my mom and my dad, uh, married until, you know, until they respectively died for over 60 years, taking care of us, teaching us the right things, not letting us get away with breaking rules and insisting that we go to school. When we were migrant children, those three years we went up to New York to work in the fields. When school started, we were in New York State, Long Island. When school started in September, our parents sent us to school. We were not made to stay in the field and work. We went to school. When we got out of school, we went back home and changed into our work clothes and went out in the fields and worked until dark. But my dad and mom could have met us. They had four, five sons, four of them old enough to work and help them. And rather than have the extra money that my brothers and I could have earned for the family, picking potatoes or whatever, we went to school and worked after school. And that was because of the emphasis, of, emphasis my parents placed on education. If you, you had to be, in order to not go to school, you had to be bleeding. You had to be throwing up. If you're vomiting, you didn't have to go, uh, you have to be really hurt to not go to school in, my, in our house. What's wrong with you, boy? I, I don't feel good. Well, you feel better at school. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing here for you, so go to school. So. Okay, well. You know, can I tell you one other thing about Bunch Park before we leave that, that, that I think is important? Yeah. When we, when we moved out there, um, the, the, um, of course, these were black men, we were veterans who, who purchased these homes. I found out about this years later, that my dad and other men in Bunch Park had a meeting with the Oklahoma Police Department and told them, don't send your officers in here. But there were no black officers at the time, but don't send your, if there's any problem in, in Bunch Park, we will take care of it. And if it's a serious problem requiring the police, we'll call you, but don't ride up and down the streets of Bunch Park in your police cars. We don't want our kids saying that. And we did, I, we didn't see police, and I'm the car's police presence around us the whole time I lived in Bunch Park. It was a safe community that the men and women of that community protected. We didn't need the police. Wow. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're right to have hesitations about the police. Um, but I tell you, Sydney, I think the um, defund the police thing has done more harm than good because white people don't understand it. And anytime we black folks have a movement that white folks don't understand, it hurts us. Um, it, it, it delays our goals. I just think this, this particular approach has been problematic because people take that to mean demolish the police, get rid of the police. And I don't, th I don't think that's the message that young people are trying to say. I think what they're trying to say is reform the police, get professional policing in our communities, get decent officers that don't abuse us, uh, shift some of your resources so that you're doing more things other than uh, social work. So those are the kinds of things I think I, I could press for. But 
I'll tell you, Sydney, on May 17th, 1980, in Liberty City, the day that riot started, I was out there all afternoon when there were no police around, and I saw Black people committing murder in broad daylight. Um, now it's a scary feeling to know there's no police coming, no police around, and people are doing, are doing anything they want to do. And I'm standing there watching these five, uh, 15 or so young Black men use the Miami Herald newspaper dispenser, street dispenser, to repeatedly kill this white boy, hitting, hitting him repeatedly with this newspaper dispenser, helpless on the ground. So that's me, I said, where's the police? Where are the cops? It was, you know, I went down to the, after seeing this, to a substation where the police were, were, were massing, and I couldn't get them to go up to Liberty City. They said they needed armored vehicles to go up there to get this boy out. So it was late that night before they finally got his body and, and his brother who was beaten severely that same day uh, before they got them out of that situation. So I guess I'm reflecting on this because if you have no police, you have no, you have no protection from the worst parts of, of humanity. And even though we may be, not maybe are protesting legitimate issues and, and, and abuses, there's always an element, as we saw during the riots, that will take advantage of what we're trying to get straightened out and start looting, burning, shooting, killing. So, you know, we need the police, but we need them to be professional, decent, respecting police officers. Oh yeah, from, uh, from Opelaka to there was nothing going down in South Bay, but Coconut Grove, uh, uh, Liberty City, Overtown. Yeah, several, several neighborhoods were involved. Four days, it started on a Saturday. Uh, by Monday, the, the uh, National Guard arrived that Sunday night, but by that time, people were retired, had to go to work. The riot was really over by the time the troops got there. And Miami is still recovering from that. We, Liberty City still has not recovered from that event. In most people's minds, black and white, it's a dangerous place to be. You could be killed. That riot legacy still lives in Liberty City, unfortunately. How about that? How about Same zip code. That? Yep, exactly. A couple of blocks difference. There's one avenue separated them. But yeah, Overtown is, uh, is going to become Wynwood. Winwood will gradually, gradually eat up over time. It's, it's happening every day now. All right, my pleasure meeting you as well. And I love your painting. When I saw that, I thought, where am I? When I see this, <laughs> that's me up there with this. Okay, you got me, Sydney. All right, I got to give it to you. So I do, I love the painting. 